بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم One thousand four hundred years ago, when the world was immersed in darkness, the Quran was revealed, which brought light to a beleaguered world. And whereas the earlier books came with many scientific mistakes, due to the hand of man having delved into them, the Quran had none of these contradictions. The world thought there could be no reconciliation between religion and science. But the Quran mentioned many scientific facts in great detail, like how a human being developed in the mother's womb, and described other scientific facts which amaze the world's renowned scientists and scientific community. Such was the impact of these revelations that the first Islamic medical conference was held at the Arab League building, Cairo, Egypt, on the 26th of September, 1985. Known from the history of embryology, little was known about the staging and classification of human embryos until the 20th century. For this reason, the descriptions of the human embryo in the Quran cannot be based on scientific knowledge in the 7th, 7th century. The only reasonable conclusion is that these descriptions were revealed to Muhammad from God. He could not have known such details because he was an illiterate man. With absolutely, absolutely no scientific training. The key word in both is al gaid, which could mean passing through or penetration of fluid into depth, like water going into the depth of the earth. And two, decrease in amount. The two statements refer to something which is passing through the female reproductive tract. Which is decreasing and/or increasing in size, and it is something whose future, at this stage, is known to no one except Allah. The most intriguing thoughts are from a hadith in Sahih Muslim, where Muhammad states, as one of the signs of the coming of the Day of Judgment, that Arab areas will return to being returned to being fertile and green and with rivers. The archaeological and geological evidence that they once were green and will become green again is less than a century old. I have been asked, could Muhammad personally have known these things? The answer of a cautious scientist is, it is not impossible, but it would require a very sophisticated awareness of natural history. The growth of the fetus progresses rapidly until the beginning of the twelfth week. After which it enters a new phase of rapid growth and dramatic changes. The rapid growth and dramatic changes which occur after the bones have been clothed by muscles have been mentioned in the Holy Quran 1,400 years ago. No such distinctive and complete record of human development existed before the Quran. It was many centuries afterwards that the human developmental stages were recorded in traditional scientific literature. The advances of modern developmental biology raise as many questions as they solve, and the physicians and scientists of today are perhaps more than ever before in need of the wisdom and counsel of scholars and religious leaders. It is not surprising then that we relook to,、uh, to our holy scriptures for help and enlightenment. From what stuff hath he created him? From a sperm drop, he hath created him and then moldeth him in due proportions. Surah 80, Ayah 18 and 19. Thank you very much. The Quran on embryology. Professor Keith Moore is one of the world's prominent scientists in the fields of anatomy and embryology, and is the author of the book entitled *The Developing Human: 
which has been translated into eight languages. The book is considered a scientific reference work and was chosen by the Special Committee in the United States as the best book authorized by one person. Dr. Keith Moore is the Professor of Anatomy and Cell Biology at the University of Toronto in Toronto, Canada. In 1984, he received the most distinguished award presented in the field of anatomy in Canada, the JCB Grant Award from the Canadian Association of Anatomists. He has directed many international associations such as the Canadian and American Association of Anatomists and the Council of the Union of Biological Sciences. Let's now listen to what Professor Keith Moore has to say about the revelations found in the Quran 1400 years ago and what science has only recently been able to find out through detailed investigation. In the 1940s, uh, Professor Streeter of the Carnegie Institute of Embryology in Washington, D.C. proposed a system for classifying the stages of human development. His system arranged human embryos in 23 numbered sta stages based on their difference, differences in appearance. The Carnegie system of classification was used around the world until the 1970s when a more refined system was proposed by Dr. Ronan O'Reilly of the Carnegie Institute of Embryology, now in San Diego, California. Intensive studies of the Quran and Hadith in the last four years have revealed a system for classifying human embryos that is amazing since it was recorded in the 7th century AD. Although Aristotle, the founder of the science of embryology, realized that chick embryos developed in stages from his studies of hen's eggs in the 4th century BC, he did not give any details about these stages. As far as it is known from the history of embryology, little was known about the staging and classification of human embryos until the 20th century. For this reason, the descriptions of the human embryo in the Quran cannot be based on scientific knowledge in the 7th, 7th century. The only reasonable conclusion is that these descriptions were revealed to Muhammad from God. He could not have known such details because he was an illiterate man with absolute, absolutely no scientific training. The first uh, stage is ad ad adapt, and you'll have to apologize my, for my pronunciation. Uh, this is from Surah uh, Tariq 6. He is created from a drop emitted. This Arabic term refers to the forceful emission of fluids which occurs during ejaculation in the male and ovulation in the female. The male secretions called semen, contain the spermatozoa, and the female secretions, called follicular fluid, contain the ovum. This is the stage of fertilization and the uh, nutva, and after the, this is what we call the zygote, uh, referred to in the Quran as the nutva, and the nutva undergoes uh, division, which we call cleavage, as it passes down the uterine tube. So these are the stages of the nutva here as it undergoes uh, cell division. Uh, it is, this term is used several times in the Quran when referring to the beginning of development. After examining all these references, it is concluded that nutva ref refers to the small drop of fluid containing the sperm and the ovum. The term nutva is also used to refer to the dividing zygote as it undergoes cleavage cell division and passes along the uterine tube to enter the uterus. This surah says, then he made his progeny from a quintessence of the nature of fluid despised. Sulala is an Arabic term, refers to the gentle extraction of the germ or sex cells from the millions that are uh, produced. There are 300 to 500 million sperms in the ejaculate of a healthy young male. Only one of these is extracted from the semen to fertilize the ovum. This shows a, a photograph of the millions of sperm uh, when they are ejaculated, and only one of the several million sperms 
are, is drawn out, which is what is suggested by the word uh, sulala. Now, the same in the case of the uh, ovary, uh, uh, only one ovum reaches maturity and is expelled from the ovary, and it is extracted from the many thousands that are available in the ovary. Again, the idea of extraction or sulala. The next stage is amshaj, amshaj sura ad der tu. Verily, we recreated man from a mixture of a germinal drop. Uh, amshaj, then, as an Arabic term, is used in the Quran to describe the mixing of the sperms and the ovum. During fertilization, uh, the ovum rotates, rotates within the fluid containing the sperms until one of them is successful in penetrating its covering layers, which we call the corona radiata and the zona pellucida, which is this layer here. Yeah, I'll read it again in English. Uh, it's Surah Abasa 19. He created a new individual from Nutva and immediately planned and programmed him. That was the first one we had. Oh, there it is. Uh, so al Kel then is an Arabic term which means coming into being and is used when referring to the fertilized ovum or zygote. Here you can see the uh, nuclei from the sperm and the ovum uniting to form a new cell which is the zygote or nutfa and uh, then uh, here's the zygote or nutfa again but it's just getting ready to divide into two cells which we call the dividing zygote or the dividing nutfa. The next stage, El Tekdir, which is the same verse that was just repeated. This Arabic term means the determination of characters and appears to refer to the fact that from the beginning, the zygote or nutfa contains genetic factors in the chromosome, contain the genes, which determine the color of the future person's eyes, hair, and skin, and all its other characteristics, such as the appearance of the face and the body. Al Harth, uh, Surah Al Bagara, Ayah 223, your wives are as a tilth unto you. This Arabic term refers to the plowing of the earth and the sowing of the seed in it. This term is used in reference to sexual intercourse, plowing, and implantation of the blastocyst, sowing of the seed. This analogy is a very good one since the blastocyst develops root like structures called chorionic villi, which derive oxygen and nutrients from the mother's blood, just as the roots of the plant, shown here, uh, derive their nutrients from the soil. Next uh, is Alaka. Let's have the next slide. Uh, Alaka is uh, Sura al Muminim Ayah 14. Then we created the drop into a leech-like structure, then of that leech-like structure, we made a chewed-like substance. Uh, Alaka refers to a leech-like appearance, especially at about 22 days, as shown in this slide. This is a leech, and this is the human embryo, but 23 days. I think you have to agree that the similarity between these uh, structures is amazing, and that it is truly, the human embryo is truly leech-like. The leech-like embryo is attached to the chorionic sac, which is embedded in the maternal blood and attached to the maternal endometrium, or the lining of the uterus. This is uh, the mudga stage, Surah al muminim ayah 1 to 14, and I repeated that before. Then we created the drop into a leech-like structure. Then of that leech-like structure, we made a chewed-like substance which you can see here, and begins during the sixth week. Next uh, stage is uh, Al Kissa Bil Lan, Surah Al Mu Minim Ayah 14. Then we close the bones with flesh. So in the previous stage, then we had the bones, and then we covered the bones with flesh. So this Arabic term means a clothing uh, with flesh, and after the bones form, they become surrounded or clothed by flesh or muscles, which acquire attachments to them. These muscle attachments 
permit movements of the skeleton to occur. Now this is the final stage of development called El Nasha. Uh, then we developed of him another creation. Uh, El Nasha means uh, growth or coming into being. This undoubtedly refers to the fetal period when there is growth and differentiation of the embryo that developed in the embryonic period. The rate of body growth during the fetal period is remarkable, especially between the ninth and sixteenth weeks. You notice how quickly it's growing in this uh, nasha stage or uh, fetal period as we call it. The next uh, stage is El Kablia. This sir says that the duration of pregnancy and separation is 30 months. This uh, Arabic term refers to the viability or ability of the human fetus to survive outside the uterus. There is no definite time when survival of the fetus is assured, but it is generally accepted now that a fetus that is 24 weeks or older has a reasonable chance of survival. Survival of fetuses 22 to 24 weeks old has only been become possible in the last few years uh, when better methods of providing care for premature infants uh, were developed. So uh, the period a uh, viable embryo or a fetus would be here at 24 weeks. We used to say 26, 28, but now with better incubation, uh, some babies at 24 weeks can survive. And we've even had some at 22 weeks, but this takes highly sophisticated incubation uh, to do that. So this uh, period then is the uh, period of uh, viability or the ability of the human fetus to survive. The next stage is the al Hadana, al Rahimia. This uh, stage refers to the final stages of fetal development in the uterus when the fetus could survive if born prematurely, but it remains in the uterus where it is supported or nourished by the mother. In most cases, therefore, the uterus acts as an incubator for the premature infant. Weight gain during these final weeks is phenomenal as the fetus accumulates fat and is gradually prepared for birth. This last uh, ayah is Surah Abasa, ayah 19 and 20. From a drop, he created him and immediately planned and programmed him. Then he makes his passage easy. This uh, Arabic term uh, means to make the passage easy. It is well known that as the time of birth approaches, the maternal tissues of the cervix and the joints of the pelvis become looser so that the passage of the fetus through the fetal canal will be facilitated. This process, initiated by hormones in the mother's blood, accelerates during the early stages of labor or delivery of the baby. As the amniochorionic sac, that is the bag of waters surrounding the baby, expands near the time of birth, it protrudes into the cervix, that is the neck of the uterus, and causes it to dilate. When the amniochorionic sac ruptures, the amniotic fluid provides a slippery pathway for the fetus to pass along the cervix and vagina to the outside of its mother. All the above occurrences facilitate the birth of the baby, that is, they make the passage easy. The stages of embryonic and fetal development mentioned in the Quran should be used when teaching Muslim students because they are in accordance with our modern understanding of the development before birth. It will also enable Muslim doctors and nurses to explain human development to their patients using Quranic references. Mohammed could not have known these facts about human development in the seventh century because most of them were not discovered until the 20th century. Muslims and others are justified in concluding that these facts could only have been revealed to Muhammad by the one known who knows all about us, not only about how we developed, but how we live and function. Thank you very much. The Quran on Embryology Dr. E. Marshall Johnson Dr. E. Marshall Johnson is Professor Emeritus of Anatomy and Developmental Biology at Thomas Jefferson University, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, USA. There, for 20 years, he was Professor of Anatomy, the Chairman of the Department of Anatomy, and the Director of the Daniel Bow Institute.
He was also the president of the Teratology Society. He has authored more than 200 publications. As you follow Dr. Marshall on this incredibly detailed journey, he leaves you in no doubt as to the only possible conclusion that can be made. The two statements uh, that I have are that, number one, Allah knows what every female womb bears and what is penetrating into the womb or decreasing and what is increasing. The second is none knows the future of what is decreasing or penetrating into the wombs except Allah. The two statements taken together can be considered the period of early embryogenesis from insemination to early implantation of the fertilized ovum. The key word in both is al guide which could mean passing through or penetration of fluid into depth, like water going into the depth of the earth. And two, decrease in amount. The two statements refer to something which is passing through the female reproductive tract, which is decreasing and or increasing in size, and it is something whose future at this stage is known to no one except Allah. This something, evidently, is a reference to the male and female generative materials and later to the zygote. When different meanings of the key word al guide are applied to the ayah and the hadith, these evidently point to the developmental processes taking place up to the stage of early implantation. It is science, could I have the next slide please? It is scientifically established or proven that of the several millions of spermatozoa in the seminal fluid, a great many of them as illustrated here, will not pass through the cervical canal, and half of those which do pass through the cervical canal will go up into a fallopian tube or an oviduct where there is no ova. However, some of those which do pass through the cervical canal will pass into the correct oviduct and into the presence of a, an ovum if one is there. The next slide is that of those spermatozoa which actually do get into the vicinity of the ovum, only one of them fuse with the surface membrane of the ovum. This we call the uniting of the uh, sperm and the ovum. Actually, it's a fusion of the cell membranes so that the genetic material then passes inside of the uh, ovum. At this particular time, the destiny of the genetic program, the genetic destiny of this individual is established. We don't know what it is at this time, but we do know, of course, that as the chromosomes of the two come together, the genetic program uh, is established at this time. Another uh, biologic phenomenon which is consistent with the word al guide, and that is that as the individual, the female child is born, she is born with all of the ova which she potentially will shed. So she will have several hundred thousand ova. During her reproductive lifespan, of course, relatively few of these will be actually ovulated. So from amongst the many ova available, relatively few are then chosen to be ovulated. And if a spermatozoa is there, then at that particular time, uh, it could be uh, fertilized. So therefore, when al guide is taken to mean a passing through, it will cover the period of the journey of the ovum as it takes from the oviduct and eventually through the uterus uh, to the time of implantation. When it reaches implantation, 
it will pass into a, another stage of development uh, that is to the uh, Alaka stage. Thank you. The Quran on Geology Dr. Allison Pete Palmer About our speaker, born and raised in New Jersey, A.R., Pete Palmer earned his B.S. in Geology from Pennsylvania State in 1946 and a Ph.D. in Geology from the University of Minnesota in 1950. During his lengthy career, he has held various positions in geology and paleontology, including Cambrian Geologist, Paleontologist, U.S. Geological Survey in Washington, D.C. from 1950 to 1966, Professor of Geology, State University of New York at Stony Brook from 1966 to 1980 and Centennial Science Program Coordinator, mega editor for about 40 volumes of multi-authored books on the geology of North America for the Geological Society of America in Boulder from 1980 to 1993. Since 1993, he has been recentered as president of the small non-profit institute for Cambrian studies. Dr. Allison Pete Palmer, will now take you on an historic passage through time, using the now recently obtained knowledge from geological sciences, which he verifies so wondrously using chosen verses from the Quran and clearly stated comments of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, known as Hadith. In order to discuss the significance of geological ideas or perceptions from the Quran and Hadith, it is first necessary to provide some background information describing where geology is today and how it got there. Geology began as a science slightly less than 200 years ago. Although various geological perceptions date back to Aristotle over 2,000 years ago, these perceptions were never integrated into an identifiable science until James Hutton recognized the implications of the now famous angular unconformity at Sicker Point in western Scotland in 1788. The Earth's crust was deformed and these sediments, now cemented into rock, were tilted and a plain was developed by erosion across their upturned edges. More sediments, a minimum of 2,100 meters thick, accumulated on this plain and in the course of time were cemented to form rock. Erosion of this thick series of rocks, which is still in progress at the present time, has cut a deep canyon through these rocks, exposing the evidence of their history. This deeply eroded land surface is essentially the only land surface that human beings have ever seen. But what a magnificent history is revealed. The vastness of this history is clearly demanded by the logical implications of the angular unconformity. This evidence that the earth had a long history far beyond the memory of man was the basis for the science of geology. In the two centuries since Hutton saw and understood his angular unconformity in Scotland, geologists have been busily, busy unraveling this history. The unraveling was helped by several additional fundamental but simple ideas. First, Shells, bones, and plant remains found in rocks were recognized as records of life of the past. By the early 1800s, it was further recognized that the record of life in the rocks was different than it is today, and that the further back in time one went, that is, in lower and lower layers in the sequences of layered rocks, the more different the fossil record became. Thus, an empirical succession of geological ages was established, each age was characterized by different assemblages of fossils found in the rocks. What do the Quran and Hadith say about all of this? Some key words from various parts of the Quran and Hadith have interesting implications. According to Surah 29, Ayah 20, God says, walk through the earth and see how God did originate creation. The story that I have just presented is the product of thousands of geologists walking through the earth observing and thinking about their observations, primarily since the early 1800s. Next slide. Surah 79, Ayah 31, discussing creation and the earth, states, He draweth out therefrom its moisture. 
although this seems to be in a context of springs because the following phrase mentions pastures, it is permissible to consider that this refers to outgassing of volcanoes early in Earth history. Volcanic gases include large amounts of water vapor and carbon dioxide. We believe that volcanoes early in Earth's history were the sources for the oceans and the atmosphere, an understanding only reached within the last century. Next slide. IS 79, I mean, Shusur 79, IS 32 states, also in the context of creation, and the mountains hath he firmly fixed. Similar mention of mountains is found in several other suras. It is permissible to interpret this to imply that mountains are rooted and that modern, ge and modern geophysics has established deep crustal roots for the axial parts of mountain systems at converging plate boundaries. Several suras mention geological perceptions tied to earthquakes. Next slide. Surah 86, Ayah 12, in a context of predicting happenings on the day of judgment, states, and by the earth, which has faults. And Surah 67, Ayah 16, next slide. In a context of punishment for unbelievers, states, are you sure that God will not cause you to be swallowed up by the earth when it is turbulent? It is permissible to interpret these suras as evidence of the awareness of great faults within the earth and of a turbulent interior, parts of the recent developments in plate tectonics. Other suras seem to refer to changing dimensions of continents. Next slide. In a context of creation, Surah 70, Ayah 30 says, and the earth, here in the sense of continents, moreover, hath he expanded. Next slide. Surah 13, I have 41, in a context referring to the power of God, states, See they not that we gradually reduce the continents? And in Surah 13, Ayah 3, in the context of creation, we see, And it is he who expanded the earth and set thereon mountains standing firm and rivers. The concept of change in the geographic dimensions of the continents is a very modern concept. Perhaps the most intriguing thoughts are from a hadith in Sahih Muslim, where Muhammad states as one of the signs of the coming of the Day of Judgment, next slide, that Arab areas will return to being, return to being fertile and green and with rivers. The archeological and geological evidence that they once were green and will become green again is less than a century old. I have been asked, could Muhammad personally have known these things? The answer of a cautious scientist is, it is not impossible but it would require a very sophisticated awareness of natural history. The Middle East has been and still is one of the more earthquake-prone parts of the world. Oral tradition may have mentioned fractures opening during earthquakes, and certainly the earth trembles as if its interior were turbulent on such occasions. In summary, the Islamic texts can be divided into three categories related to the past, the present, and the future. References to the past are expanding and shrinking of the earth, fixing of the mountains, deriving moisture from the earth's interior, and description of the past climate of the Arabian Peninsula. References to the present are the presence of great faults, a turbulent earth interior, and changing dimensions of the continents. References to the future are predictions about the return of better climatic conditions to the Arabian Peninsula. What is the significance of these statements made 1,400 years ago, long before the beginning of the new science of geology? We need research into the history of early Middle Eastern oral traditions to know whether, in fact, such historical events have been reported. If there is no such record, it strengthens the belief that God transmitted through Muhammad bits of his knowledge that we have only discovered for ourselves in recent times. We look forward to a continuing dialogue on the topic of science and the Quran uh, in the context of geology. Thank you very much. The Quran on Embryology Dr. T. V. N. Persaud Dr. T. V. N. Persaud is Professor of Anatomy, Professor of Pediatrics and Child Health, and Professor of Obstetrics, Gynecology, and Reproductive Sciences at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. There he was the chairman of the Department of Anatomy for 16 years. He is well known in his field. He is the author or editor of 22 textbooks 
and has published over 180 scientific papers. In 1991, he received the most distinguished award presented in the field of anatomy in Canada, the JCB Grant Award from the Canadian Association of Anatomists. Dr. Persaud is the penultimate speaker that you are about to hear, saying what he has to say about how science is in total conformity with what was revealed in the Quran 1430 years ago to a man who was illiterate and lived at a time when it was impossible for him to know anything of the complexities of what you have so far heard. Dr. Persaud will be discussing issues pertaining to ladies and how the Quran succinctly and correctly stated scientific facts impossible for anyone to have known at that time. He further states facts and figures pertaining to the current sexual promiscuity and the health-related problems due to this. What is amazing is how this was clearly stated by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, long before any of these facts were known to the medical world. Let's now listen to what Dr. T. V. M. Persaud has to say on these amazing issues. The growth of the fetus progresses rapidly until the beginning of the twelfth week, after which it enters a new phase of rapid growth and dramatic changes. The rapid growth and dramatic changes which occur after the bones have been clothed by muscles have been mentioned in the Holy Quran 1400 years ago. And this is recorded, this is the Surah al muminum Ayah 14. The first slide is a scanning electron micrograph of an embryo that is just five weeks old. The embryo, as you will see, is curled. It is no more than a half an inch in length, and the upper part forms two-thirds of the entire body. There is a limb bud there, and there is in fact a tail. The heart is in its very primitive stage, but it's in fact beating rhythmically. And this is a special technique which is used for clearing the embryo so that it becomes transparent. And then a stain is used to stain the bony parts which have appeared, and this is what you're seeing here. It comprises mostly of cartilage which gives form to the body of the embryo and confers upon it unquestionably human characteristics. At this stage of a seven-week-old fetus, its own unique personality perhaps as a thinking, conscious and feeling being. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be unto him, mentioned all these events I've described and their time in the Hadith and may I have, we don't have a transparency, but I'll read it for you. When 42 nights have passed over the sperm drop, Allah sends an angel to it who shapes it and makes it ears, eyes, skin, flesh, and bones. Then he says, O oh Lord, is it male or female? And your Lord decides what he wishes, and the angel records it. Thank you. Now there is another concept mentioned in the Quran and that is regarding the soul. There are many thoughts and about the soul, but we know very little of his exact nature. And the Quran has indeed cited this. And this I shall read to you now. They ask thee concerning the spirit of inspiration, Shukran, say, the spirit cometh by command of my Lord. Of knowledge it is only a little that is communicated to you, O man. Thank you very much. I present in this room here, in the, to this audience, a talk I've given earlier this morning, and undoubtedly it's because of the interest of this subject. It is of wide interest, not only to Muslims, but I would say to people of all races and people in all countries of the world. And in fact, it's the first time in my life I have given the same paper twice at any conference. And so I feel very special, specially honored. And it deals with the Quranic rules regarding sexuality, the most intimate of relationship between two individuals, marital or sexual relations, and what, what the Quran says 
about certain aspects of the relationships between man and woman. And there are two or three areas I will touch upon. And the first we will talk about deals with the menstrual cycle. Apart from the aesthetic and hygienic aspects of having sexual intercourse during a woman's menstrual period, there is potential harm for both partners. Regarding the menstrual flow itself, the following statement taken from the 16th edition, which is 1980, of the standard well-known Williams Obstetrics should be noted. And concerning these problems, the Quran states in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 222, they ask they concerning women's courses, say they are a harm and a pollution, so keep away from women in their courses and do not approach them until they are clean. Sexual promiscuity, another area I like to briefly touch on, has long been associated with several venereal infections, in particular syphilis and gonorrhea. The risk of sexually acquired infection increases significantly with exposure to multiple sexual partners. Of great concern is the alarming increase in the incidence of diagnosed genital herpes because of sexual permissiveness. According to the United States Department of Health and Human Studies, which maintain very, very reliable statistics, maybe as many as 20 million individuals have genital herpes, and about 300,000 cases are expected annually. And each year, between 20,000 and 50,000 new cases of genital herpes are reported in Canada, where very reliable statistics are kept. In 1982, there were over 6,000 cases of herpes virus infections reported alone in Canada. More than 40% of these infections were sexually transmitted and largely involved young adults between the ages of 15 and 19 years. And for many other countries, not only the United States and Canada, it's simply because I have these statistics available and I can depend and rely on them, but the statistics are the same and the prevalence of genital herpes infection makes the disease a virtual epidemic. Among sexually transmitted diseases, it is second only to gonorrhea. The highest incidence of genital herpes occurs among prostitutes, sexually promiscuous young adults, and sexual partners who previously have had herpes infection. In general, this age group is at the highest risk of acquiring sexually transmitted diseases. Within the last three years, there has been an increasing number of reports on acquired immune deficiency syndrome, which you all know as AIDS, a disease of emerging epidemic proportion. It is attracting an extraordinary amount of attention. Some of you may know that it was featured in the August issue of Time magazine. Interest and concern on account of its unknown etiology and poor prognosis. There is no known cure for this illness too which makes previously healthy adults become immunodeficient and in most cases the victims will die. It is particularly prevalent among male homosexuals, but epidemiological trends indicate that it is slowly increasing among heterosexuals and will gradually spread to the general population. In fact, this has been predicted by just about every agency studying AIDS that this will gradually permeate into the general population. As you can see, AIDS as a public health problem has been featured as a, not a public, as a national problem, an international problem, a problem of worldwide concern, has been featured in Times Magazine. It is now considered to be the most important new public health disease in North America. Because of the progressive and relentless epidemic, there is every fear that the disease, with all its frightening implications, might gradually spread to the general population. The consequences and dangers of promiscuous sexual relationships and deviant sexual practices have been expressed in this hadith some 1400 years ago. The lewdness will not exist among people until they appear as a common practice and plagues a new disease which did not exist before 
will spread among them. The word lewdness encompasses adultery, fornication, I'm told, homosexuality, bestiality, and all other sexual perversions. And it is not wide stretched of any imagination that we should not consider herpes and AIDS as clear examples of new diseases and indeed at the present time new diseases for which we have no cure. Thank you very much. The Quran on Scientific Facts and Discovery Dr. Gerald C. Goringer Dr. Gerald C. Goringer is course director and associate professor of medical embryology at the Department of Cell Biology, School of Medicine, Georgetown University, Washington, D.C., USA. Former winner of 1989, the Golden Apple Award. Gerald C. Goringer's Ph.D. is in anatomy and cell biology. The final speaker from amongst these world-renowned scientists will now tell us, as all the others have, that the scientific knowledge that was only available to mankind in the last century or so is in complete harmony with the Qur'an. Mr. Chairman, eminent scholars, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted and honored to have this opportunity to uh, be here before you and share some of these uh, magnificent experiences with you. Uh, in this paper this morning, we attempt to briefly outline some of the milestones in the history of embryology by way of setting the stage for the analyses of most of the other speakers who will follow. Regarding many of the points we emphasize, you will recognize pertinent passages in the Holy Quran. Let us commence with a fundamental question of biological science, a question that has commanded the attention of scholars and scientists from the earliest recorded history through today. It is a question that is also documented in the Holy Quran. Simply put, it is how does man develop? This question rings through the centuries, and the record of our attempts to answer it comprise much of the history of science in general. Therefore, the history of embryology is linked inescapably to the history of science in general, inasmuch as embryology deals with the genesis of all higher life forms, it is also closely related to the historical development of philosophical thought. Indeed, the scientist of not too many years ago referred to himself and was referred to by others as a natural philosopher. In broad terms, we can divide the history of embryology into three phases. The first phase, which we can call descriptive embryology, traces back more than six centuries before the Christian era and extends forward into the 19th century AD. This was the time during which observations of developmental phenomena were recorded and interpreted in various ways. Some of the earliest records survive from the 4th, 5th, and 6th dynasties in ancient Egypt. The official title, Opener of the King's Placenta, is on record as being held by at least 10 successive individuals. Later, a standard representing the royal placenta, may we have the first slide, please, was carried ahead of the pharaohs. The properties attributed to the placenta 
were of magical or mystical significance. In fact, until the time of the ancient Greeks and after, science and magic were closely joined. It was the Greeks who elevated science into the realm of reason. This by virtue of the fact that observations were less often interpreted in terms of the mystical, but rather in the light of reason. In point of fact, were it not for a number of Arab writers, many of the earlier Greek works would have been lost to us. During the 16th, but especially in the 17th and 18th centuries, scientific inquiry flourished, and the works of Vesalius, Fabricius, and Harvey set the stage for the era of microscopy. This was a period of lively debate. The spermatozoan had been discovered, and the questions of preformation, spontaneous generation, the egg, ovism, and animalculism were endlessly discussed and debated. Now this is rather short shrift for three exciting centuries, so let us just briefly look at some of the things that were seen as they were seen during this time. First, some illustrations from the literature of midwifery during the 16th century. Next slide, please. Showing how, from a coagulum of blood, in the upper left, and seed, a fetus develops. It can be traced down through to the lower right, where, in the imagination of the author of this work, from this blood clot, a human fetus actually arose. Menstrual blood was commonly thought to give rise to the embryo uh, during this time. Before discussing the rise of experimental embryology, let's turn for a brief moment to the instrument that capped the progress of descriptive embryology and which is used just as frequently today, albeit in somewhat more sophisticated form, the microscope. Next slide, please. This 17th century development led to the publication by Ham and Van Leeuwenhoek of the announcement of the discovery of spermatozoa. Next slide, please. Published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. This is 1677. Illustrations of human spermatozoa published in 1701. Next slide, please. Are seen here uh, grouped among uh, illustrations of sheep sperm. What marvelous times these were. What controversies and arguments raged over observations made and or imagined. Look at this illustration of human semen. Next slide, please. This is the homunculus which we have seen many times during this uh, Congress. But look at this photograph from my own laboratory just a few years ago. Next slide, please. Although this is part of an experiment unlikely to have been considered during the 17th or 18th centuries, it is not too difficult to imagine how different structures could be imagined uh, to exist in spermatozoa. With all this remarkable progress, much of what we have discussed has already been described and with infinitely more elegance in the Holy Quran. Recent analysis of passages from the Quran reveals a description of human developmental stages from the earliest through and beyond organogenesis. No such distinctive and complete record of human development existed before the Quran. It was many centuries afterwards that the human developmental stages were recorded in traditional scientific literature. With the benefit of historical perspective and the accumulated wisdom of those who have gone before, we are in a position today not only to appreciate the remarkable contributions to science of these giants of the past, but just as importantly, 
we can better appreciate how much we still do not know about development. The advances of modern developmental biology raise as many questions as they solve. And the physicians and scientists of today are perhaps more than ever before in need of the wisdom and counsel of scholars and religious leaders. It is not surprising then that we relook to, uh, to our holy scriptures for help and enlightenment. From what stuff hath he created him? From a sperm drop he hath created him and then moldeth him in due proportions. Surah 80, Ayah 18 and 19. Thank you very much. Quran and Science. And those to whom knowledge has come, see that the revelation sent down to you from your Lord, that is the truth, and that it guides to the path of the exalted in might, worthy of all praise. The Noble Quran, chapter 34, verse 6. The Quran calls people to worship only one God, the creator of everything. Say, He is Allah, the one and only. Allah, the Eternal, Absolute, He begets not, nor is He begotten, and there is none like unto Him. The Quran is a book of guidance and not a book of science. It is just a proof that it was revealed from the one Creator who knows everything about us. We will soon show them our signs in the universe and in their own souls, until it will become quite clear to them that it is the truth. Is it not sufficient as regards your Lord that he is a witness over all things? The Noble Quran, chapter 41, verses 53. The Quran mentioned many scientific facts, like the origin of the universe and how it came into existence, this included facts related to how it began and facts related to how it will end. Like the theory of the Big Bang, for example, and that everything came into existence after it, and our Earth was one of these structures that were formed from this Big Bang. Such kinds of theories were way beyond our reach 1400 years ago, and it is only now that science has begun to unravel some of the facts surrounding the creation of the universe. However, the Quran mentioned that our earth was part of the skies and then became separated from it. Allah says in the Quran, Have not those who disbelieve known that the heavens and the earth were joined together as one united piece, then we parted them? And we have made from water every living thing. Will they not then believe? The Noble Quran, chapter 21, verse 30. And the Quran mentioned that our space is expanding. That's because after the Big Bang, every planet and star is moving away from each other. Allah says in the Quran, With power did we construct the heaven. Verily, we are able to extend the vastness of space thereof. The Noble Quran, chapter 51, verses 47. And the Quran mentioned that all the planets are running in an orbit, and the sun is running to its resting place. That resting place is the translation of the Arabic word mustaqar, which indicates an exact appointed place and fixed time. According to modern astronomy, the solar system is indeed moving in space at a rate of 12 miles per second towards a point situated in the constellation of Hercules Alpha Lyres, whose exact location has been precisely calculated. Astronomers have named that mustaqar the solar apex. Allah says in the Quran, And the sun runs on its fixed course for a term appointed. That is the decree of the Almighty, the All-Knowing. The Noble Quran, chapter 36, verses 38. 
and that our universe will end by rolling together like sheets or records. Allah says in the Quran, And remember the day when we shall roll up the heavens like a scroll rolled up for books. As we began the first creation, we shall repeat it. It is a promise binding upon us. Truly, we shall do it. The Noble Quran, chapter 21, verses 104. And the last scientific fact we want to present to you is regarding the fingertips of the human being. The Quran mentioned that every human has a unique fingerprint and it is used as a very important method of identification around the world. But what is even more amazing is this feature of the fingerprint was only discovered in the late 19th century. Before then, people regarded the fingerprints as ordinary codes without any specific importance or meaning. However, in the Quran, God points to the fingertips, which did not attract anyone's attention at that time. And he drew our attention to this important matter, which has now only been understood in our age. Allah says in the Quran, Does man, a disbeliever, think that we shall not assemble his bones? Yes, we are able to put together in perfect order the tips of his fingers. The Noble Quran, chapter 75, verses 3 and 4. There are still many scientific facts in the Quran for any knowledgeable individual or scientist to explore, like it says in the Quran. And those to whom knowledge has come, see that the revelation sent down to thee from thy Lord, that is the truth, and that it guides to the path of the exalted in might, worthy of all praise. The Noble Quran, chapter 34, verses 6.